Olá, começa agora o programa Boa Vontade Entrevista, que tem apresentado para você uma série de gravações que foram feitas durante o 25º Congresso Internacional de História da Ciência e Tecnologia, que aconteceu pela primeira vez no Hemisfério Sul, tendo o Brasil como país sede. Esse evento ocorreu na UFRJ, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, na Urca, Zona Sul, aqui da cidade do Rio de Janeiro. O evento reuniu pesquisadores, estudiosos do Brasil e do mundo que dialogaram sobre esse tema, ciência, tecnologia e também sobre medicina. Hoje nós vamos acompanhar a entrevista do apresentador da Boa Vontade TV, Josué Bertolin, com o senhor Ronald Numbers. Ele é professor da Universidade de Wisconsin Madison, presidente do Comitê Internacional de Programação do Evento e um dos principais pesquisadores em história da ciência e da religião. Vamos acompanhar. First of all, I would like to thank you very much, Professor, for accepting our invitation to speak with the Brazilian audience. You're very welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Well, Professor, you were named the president of the International Program Committee. How was this experience? Uh, this was an interesting experience. I, I worked very closely and harmoniously with the local arrangements people in, in Brazil. It wasn't entirely new experience. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, I was president of the International Union and so got involved with uh, organizing a program then. So uh, I, I knew the ropes. Right. You <coughs> research in the field of the history of science and religion and you are related to the history of science in a general view. How is the history of science throughout the world? The history of science throughout the world is gaining, but not in the places once predicted. It's probably in a steady state in North America and Europe, which were the dominant homes for the history of science for decades. And it is booming in China. There are over 2,000 uh, historians of science in China. And I've been told over 40 graduate programs in universities. And the other big surprise is Brazil, where the Brazilian History of Science Society uh, gets uh, 800 people to show up. So these are big surprises and uh, it's not inevitable because, for example, India does not have a lot of historians of science and yet it's like China, very large and prosperous. Uh, and other Latin American countries uh, maybe with the exception of Mexico, uh, have a few historians of science. For some reason, it's really expanded uh, in Brazil and done pretty well in Mexico as well. Well, Professor, you research specifically the history of science and religion. How is this debate today? Is the war over or is it coming back? There's been for about a century now, uh, interest in uh, the relationship between science and religion. And for a long time, uh, the default uh, narrative was one of conflict and, and warfare. And then between the world wars, uh, we saw a few studies, uh, one by Robert Merton, who was a sociologist, but he wrote a historical study about the relationship uh, between uh, religion and science in the founding of the British Royal Society, uh, and showing a much more compatible uh, relationship. And immediately after the war, uh, World War II, uh, as we saw professional historians of science being trained for the first time, really, uh, several of those wrote about science and religion. 
And most of those uh, did not focus on conflict or, or warfare. About 40 years ago, uh, a number of historians began focusing, perhaps not exclusively, but largely on this topic. And the huge majority of those, they were professional historians of science. Interestingly, very few historians of religion took up science and religion. A few, but not many. And the historians of science uh, kept examining or re-examining episodes involving the two and found that the story was much more interesting than one of conflict or, or warfare. Uh, it was, as uh, it came to be seen, as a complex relationship. Not to deny conflict, we know there has been conflict of various, at various levels, from institutional to psychological. Uh, but overall, uh, religion uh, has, has aided science. Uh, about 15 years ago, one of the most prominent historians of science, John Heilbrunn, who had been vice chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley, now living in near Oxford in England, wrote a book, The Sun in the Cathedral, and said in the introduction, no institution provided greater support for science for 600 years from the 12th century to the 18th century than the Roman Catholic Church. And what's counterintuitive about that is that in right in the middle of the 600 years came the Galileo affair. And that's the stereotypical episode for many people to represent the warfare between science and religion. And then another uh, historian, a medieval historian, uh, who is co-editor of the Cambridge History of Science volume on the Middle Ages, said, we actually can extend Heilbrunn's generalization to all of natural philosophy for 600 years. No institution provided greater support than the Catholic Church. And he focuses on support in Catholic universities. Well, it's a broad perspective of what's going on between science and religion. You also stated in your presentation here some surveys that show that the, a majority of scholars and university professors, they don't see uh, science and religion to be at war. And you wrote a book called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. I would ask you, seeing all this, when are we going to get Galileo out of jail? I did. <laughs> I did. Yes, I freed him. Uh, in many accounts, uh, poor Galileo gets dragged down to Rome, thrown in, in an inquisition cell, tortured within a, an inch of his death, uh, forced to uh, reject his views uh, and then whispering as he leaves, but it does move. <laughs> well, it's a good story. And we know now uh, from careful historical research, not from me, but from Galileo experts, uh, using the uh, Inquisition archives that weren't open for a long time are now, are now open and can track Galileo almost hour by hour when he was in Rome. And one of the interesting aspects is not too long before he was summoned to Rome, uh, he became uh, a member of the Catholic clergy. He had uh, the tonsure and this made him eligible for some appointments. Uh, but it also meant 
that if you were a member of the clergy, certain types of torture would not be used on you, if in fact they wanted to torture him. So he gets brought down to Rome uh, for teaching contrary to what he had been instructed uh, 15, 16 years earlier, uh, the Copernican theory, uh, in the form of dialogues. So he thought he was clever enough uh, to get around this, but uh, some people saw through that. <laughs> when he comes down to Rome, instead of being thrown into jail, he's, uh, well, he stays for a while uh, in the Tuscan embassy, honored guests. Then he's taken over to the palace of the Inquisition, not thrown into a cell, but given a three-room apartment that the notary gave up so that he could have very comfortable quarters. And if the Inquisition had bad food, he didn't have to eat it because his meals were catered from the Tuscan embassy down there. So pretty well treated. Uh, also, he was an old man and not in good health. And there were rules uh, regarding if you were going to put somebody on the rack, for example, you had to wait a number of hours after eating so there wouldn't be a mess to clean up. You can imagine what that would, was. So you piece everything together as the experts have done. And there's very little time left unexplained or unaccounted for. Uh, it's almost certain now that he was never jailed. He was never tortured. Perhaps he had some psychological uh, concerns, uh, but no physical torture. And there's no reason to believe that he feared for his death. And he was. Uh, found guilty and sentenced to house arrest. Um, we have the complexity thesis. Is it enough or do we have to look at it and maybe reflect upon going beyond it or maybe it suits its purpose? Well, I should make an apology here. <laughs> um, my colleague David Lindbergh, now deceased, and I uh, published a collection of essays uh, about 1980, where we use the, the term complex, the terms complex and complexity. We never identified it as a thesis. But when John Hedley Brook bought out his wonderful volume, Science and Religion, uh, in a review, I dubbed it the complexity thesis. Uh, without thinking much, it seemed like a catchy phrase, uh, as some people have pointed out, in fact, at our seminars yesterday and today, that there's really no complexity thesis. Uh, every historian you would talk to would tell you history always is complex. There are always various interests involved and differences by place and gender and class and um, so there's nothing unique about complexity. What it means is simply we want to look at the historical record, at the documents, see what was going on and describe it rather than impose on this. Now you probably know that just as there are warfare uh, advocates. There are harmony advocates too, maybe not so widely known, who say Christianity gave birth to modern science and has been the primary supporter. Well, we know sometimes it has, but the fact to, to identify Christianity as the parent of, of uh, science Reductionist views are always dangerous. Exactly, and that overlooks what the ancient Greeks, 
non-Christians, the uh, Muslims, non-Christians, Jews, uh, contributed, uh, as well as some Indians and Chinese later on. Right. Professor, um, what do you think of scientists that express their faith in doing their science? Is this historically possible and actually possible, or, or should we apply what Stephen Jay Gould uh, affirms being the non-overlapping magisterium? What do you think about this? Well, I'm a very strong believer in freedom of speech, and it makes no difference to me whether a scientist wants to say he's an atheist or an agnostic or a Christian, as long as they're doing good science. That's all that should count, I think. Uh, and doing good science for the last 200 years has meant when you're doing science and publishing science, you don't invoke the supernatural. Uh, and it's called methodological naturalism. And I think that's been a wonderful thing for the progress of science in that it allowed people of all faiths and political views to practice science uh, as long as they didn't interject into the explanatory uh, system. So, yeah, I, I see no problem. And throughout history, we've had uh, people, uh, Christians and, and uh, scientists of other faiths, uh, profess their views. I mean, one of the most prominent scientists in the United States now is Francis Collins, who's a, a very uh, prominent Christian, um, is an evolutionist. Uh, but a, a good evangelical Christian, and uh, why not? He was the head of Project Genoma, Genoma, right? Yes, 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 right. Professor, I would like to make you a final question. Um, much of history of science and religion has been researched in Europe, in the United States. What would you expect of researchers that look to Latin America, but especially to Brazil? Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, John Brooke and I, a few years back, did uh, edited a study and organized this group looking at science and religion around the world. And uh, everything held together until we got to Asia and everything fell apart when we got to Sub-Saharan Africa because the very categories, science and religion, haven't existed. And uh, before Western missionaries arrived, there's no parallel with anything uh, in, in Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. Brazil and Latin America uh, are easy. Uh, we see, well, as I mentioned at the beginning, in Brazil, tremendous growth of professional historians of science. Uh, in Brazil, it's been spreading uh, since about the turn of the century, maybe a little before, very rapidly from, you know, Mexico, Bolivia, Brazil, Argentina, and many other countries. So, uh, I see Latin America, I've been so impressed with this uh, meeting, uh, the quality of uh, research in the history of science, medicine, and technology in Latin America is right up there with international standards. Professor, thank you very much for You're this welcome. chat. Enjoy Congratulations you. on your work. It's very important for the field of history of science and religion. Thank, thank you once again. Thank okay. you so much. Na edição de hoje do programa Boa Vontade Entrevista, você acompanhou a última gravação de uma série de programas que foram feitos durante o 25º Congresso Internacional de História da Ciência e Tecnologia, que aconteceu pela primeira vez no Hemisfério Sul, tendo o Brasil como país sede. Evento que ocorreu na UFRJ, a Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro e... Aconteceram uma série de diálogos que você acompanhou aqui na Boa Vontade TV, falando sobre a história da ciência, da tecnologia, também sobre pesquisas científicas, registros históricos no campo da saúde, da religião, da tecnologia e ainda sobre energia elétrica. 
Hoje nós conferimos essa conversa do apresentador da Boa Vontade TV, Josué Bertolin, com o senhor Ronald Numbers, professor da Universidade do Wisconsin Madison, presidente do Comitê Internacional de Programação do evento e um dos principais pesquisadores em história da ciência e da religião. O programa Boa Vontade Entrevista fica por aqui agradecendo, como sempre, o carinho da sua audiência e convidando você a permanecer na audiência da Boa Vontade TV.